Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another ADHDC talk. I always say D. I, uh, I do have attention deficit, but the ADHC talk, the Alabama Digital Humanities Center. Um, today we're joined with the folks from the Alabama Memory Project, Dr. John Giggy and Isabella Garrison. Um, the Alabama Memory Project is a project that seeks to document and map over 800 lynchings and attempted lynchings in Alabama from 1865 to 1981. Under Principal Investigator Dr. John Giggy, the Alabama Project uh, Memory Project engages undergraduates and graduate students from a variety of disciplines um, in the documentation process which empowers students through experiential learning while building an archive that documents the legacy of racial violence in the state of Alabama. Um, and this project researches a new county each semester. Um, Dr. John Giggy is Associate Professor of History and African American Studies and Director of the Somersell Center at the University of Alabama. And Isabella Garrison is a doctoral student in the History Department at the University of Alabama and also the Vivian Malone Community History Fellow at the Summer Cell Center. Welcome, John and Isabella. I am really excited about our conversation today. Um, and I need to pull up my questions. <laughs> In all of that, I minimized a bunch of screens and minimized my questions. So they will, I'll have them in just a second here. So while, I am pulling this up. Can you guys tell me about how this project started and sort of how you, I, I think this is more a question for you, John. How, how did you imagine this project up and how did it sort of evolve into what it is right now? Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having us this morning. It's great to be here and to, we've talked over the last few months about our work together and this is just a nice natural progression. So the project began really in a conversation with a group of attorneys based in Montgomery from Equal Justice Initiative. And I've been working with them to begin to imagine the process of lynching or mapping lynching victims around the country. And what they asked me to do was to imagine a more local state-based project that principally looked at two things. One is how do you work with undergraduates at the highest level to do some of the more complicated research in social sciences and then secondly, how do you begin to create a digital memorial that once has a forward-facing research component, but also attempts to commemorate or memorialize lives lost unjustly over the last century and a half? And that led to Alabama Memories, which was an intentional effort, is an intentional effort to research and map and recover and memorialize the many lives lost to lynching. What distinguishes it from most lynching projects is that it's focused on one state, Secondly, it looks not simply at the guiding questions in the history of lynching historically, which is where did someone lose their life and why? This project, because it has a commemoration focus, also adds to those questions and says, who were these folks when they lived? Where do they, who do they love? Where do they go to school? Where do they work? Who do they leave behind? And those Research questions then lead to a deep dive on a semester, semester by basis in which students and myself, including Isabella, attempt to unpack this history of lynching. What's critical for students is to get beyond normal safeguards or, or leading questions. So they'll spend many, many months ransacking not only census records, but going to court archives around the state, trying to find any kind of leaf that suggests a a footprint left by these folks. Perhaps most importantly, though, was trying to make this accessible to the public. And over the years, we've steadily developed a much closer relationship to metadata analysis and the ADHC in an effort to create a public facing and public accessible research project. Because I know from the last few years, a main constituent of the research are families of loved ones who lost their lives to lynching. So part of the obligation is, can I work with students and Isabella and others to create a robust research hosting platform that eventually becomes accessible to the public such that a relative can learn much more about their, their lost ones than before. And also if they want to add to that in some capacity, offer a thought, an idea, maybe a prayer, 
So we, we have a receptacle for that in some meaningful way. Wow. It's, it's such an amazing project and I've been aware of it for several years. Um, I have, I, you know, you, you have a certain amount of notoriety within this library even because of the tasks that you have given undergraduates for researching these lynchings going through newspapers and I want to make sure that as people are thinking about your project they're understanding the depth um, of research that your undergraduate students are engaging in where they are they are going through microfilm they are they are just they are just like reading for hours and hours trying to get stuff. They're working on a, a pretty high conceptual level with reference librarians um, and archivists in order to obtain the, the documentation that you guys are getting to go into this project. And I think that's um, that's something that has impressed me over the years with your project, um, because I get to see what's happening from the library side of what in undergraduates are are learning to do. And this is this is by far some of the more sophisticated research that I've seen. Yeah, it's, it's good that you bring this up because the project is deeply collaborative at every level. So students work in teams, but I also work in teams, right? Like I work with many folks in the library or at Hool. And I work with folks around the state who want to offer ideas or research tips or whatnot. But the key for me as an historian is can I design research at the highest level for undergraduates, not just doctoral students, but what does it mean to work with someone 18, 19, 20, and give them a near impossible task to track down the life of someone that was never meant to be discovered, that's been hidden in many ways, or written about in a wrong and an unjust manner. And so that leads to a kind of brash investigation of every possible source. And those sources that are often the most revealing are the ones that are most unlikely. Sometimes we discover a prison record, in which someone has an intake and you see what their what their body, how it was described. Sometimes we find in a black newspaper, an obituary that offers a different understanding of the life lost. Or more recently, I've been doing oral histories of people who lost loved ones to lynching. Perhaps most powerful was working with a woman who saw a lynching, what that was like for her. And, and her mission was to discover that particular injustice. Particularly for her, when she saw the lynching, she lost her voice for two years as a young child. And so now she wanted to literally rediscover that voice and work with us to attempt to put words and images, not, not visual images, but images in her mind and what, what that looked like for her and why it was important to remember it. Let me bring in Isabella, because she's actually was an undergraduate in this project and now is a grad student. Like, what are your thoughts about the research? Yeah, I don't think there is a comparable class on this campus. And I've had a lot of time here. I got my undergraduate degree here, my master's, and now I'm in my doctoral studies. Um, and from my experience, especially within the humanities, I don't know of another class that asks the same thing of students. But equally, I don't know of another class that gives students as much as this class does. Um, it is sincerely, deeply collaborative at every level. We have incredible resources from the library, from community partners outside of campus, um, including church leaders and members in the Tuscaloosa community, our colleagues at the Alabama Department of Archives and History, um, and then even our colleagues at EJI who have been supported from the beginning. Much of our work though has evolved to become even more local, even more personal. The oral histories Dr. Gigi speaks of are ones that have pushed us as a project to reaffirm our initial goal, um, to memorialize these lives in a way that's radical based off of what lynching history has previously asked, which is often for these kind of meta studies. Our hope is that in being hyper-local and hyper-personal, students change, right? That I, as a student, I know I have a radically different understanding relationship of what history can do and what my responsibility is as a person that lives in the South because of this class in a way that if I had just sat in a lecture or simply read a newspaper and accepted what it said rather than probing it and doing what this course asks of you, I wouldn't have the same. Mm -hmm. Do you all have a sense of um, some of the emotional impact that it has on your students as they move through this? I'm sure that's part of the conversation um, when you begin realizing that, you know, you're researching violent death. Um, 
yeah, that's that's part of every class is, is is asking students how they're doing and being very upfront that sometimes when you research histories like this, it can be really complicated and pick up thoughts in your own life from the past. And my job there is, is to be supportive, but also directional. Like it might be valuable for you to speak to someone for, about what you're feeling right now. It doesn't happen very often. But is it part of the obligation of the class is to not to run from that, but to say, we, you know, we can work through this and there are ways we have resources on campus to help you. I think perhaps more universally, though, is that this is the class that stays with my students the most. This is the one that asks students, can I do more? Or can I, can I think about research and the humanities in a different way? Or more powerfully, why is it that this history is so literally hidden? Why does I have to work with eight different professionals around campus just to begin to unpack yeah. sources and allow for a different telling of history. And that's powerful for young people, right? Why didn't I learn this as a young person? Why don't I get pushed to ask these questions elsewhere? I think for myself on an emotional level, it's tiring sometimes. These oral histories are really complicated. I try to radically decenter myself as a professor as much as possible, allow oral histories to lead me, not me lead the oral history. It also means I have to stop sometimes because sometimes folks don't want to share an idea and it's not my responsibility or obligation to push any further. But I think in the end, it, it creates a longer timeline for the research, but it produces a, a much broader and robust understanding of how the past operates and reaches into the, into the present such that I'm often literally at the mercy of someone's memory. Do they want to share? What part do they want to share it? Do they want to offer up a record, an obituary, a picture? Sometimes the answer is no, and, and that's okay. That's okay sometimes. Yeah, this work is deeply relationally driven. Um, as much as it is a project that asks for a really high level of historical work that is very traditional, right? That combs through whatever the archive can offer you, that asks you to push beyond. We are only able to do that and then to sustain the emotional effort it requires because of the relationships in the community the class builds. One of the things that was distinct in my experience as a freshman in this course was feeling a real community in the class, not just colleagues or classmates I could check in on, but people who are united in a value system and a mission. And that's been constant. I've been able to see the class in every iteration since then, and that's a constant for every class, which I think provides part of the necessary backbone when we're asking students to engage in this type of work at memorialization. When students are invited and we get to join when Dr. Gage does these oral histories, I think it would be impossible to engage with those in a way that is respectful and, and productive if we were not constantly engaging in these conversations together and able to trust each other to do that. Um, so at every level, the work needs these relationships and needs this trust that we build. Yeah. I think this might be a nice time for you guys to show us some of the stuff that you've gathered and, and, and give us some visuals of um, of this project because it's it's all of this documentation but as a DH project it's built out into an incredibly visually stimulating and aesthetically motivating um, project that a, a person experiences as they move through it. Yeah. Yeah so today what we'll share with you guys is both what we aim for our public facing website to look like um, we're right now working with the ADHC to reboot the public facing website to make it more accessible by migrating from WordPress to Omeka S um, to meet what our metadata needs are now, which are increasingly complex than we initiated the website seven years ago. We'll also share with you a unique data processing tool that an undergraduate student named Nick Daria worked with us to develop called Research Alabama Memory. This is how we make this level, this tool is how we make this level of research complexity and metadata complexity accessible to undergraduates. It basically transforms everything we know metadata should do into a Google Sheet at a higher level and a Google Form uh, yeah. that allows students to engage with it in a way that, that makes sense for them. One, th one thing that's interesting with the project is students often want to take pictures of where they've been. And so we've, been, we've, and it's voluntary, but many of them are drawn to landscape. As they spend 12, 15, sometimes more than a year worth of weeks in a community, they, they take pictures. Many of them are quite haunting. We're developing a kind of standing 
series of images that ask us why. So in this case, we're looking at a, a piece of Alabama's landscape in which there was a killing here. But there's nothing here but a small tree. This is roughly the exact area. But it's also an invitation for all of us to ask why. Why do we know more? Why is there no memory? And that leads to obligation. Like, how do we do things differently? How do we begin to unearth documentation that can lead to a, a different understanding of, of, of this particular area that's so desolate and bereft of, of, of a kind of understanding of what happened here and then a memorialization to some kind of life that was lost? This is also... Uh a response to the current historiography of lynching history. Um, part of the goal with site visits and encouraging students to engage with this, which they don't do alone, right? If a student chooses to travel around the state, Dr. Giggy is always with them. A graduate student or other students are always with them. Um, this, this work is taxing and visiting the site is enormously emotionally difficult. The present historiography often focuses on and scholarship focuses on images of lynchings when the actual murder happens. Something that we hold as a value for the project is recreating that visual imagery of lynching to think more about how can we memorialize the life of a person rather than simply the death and the murder. Uh, that's part of the goal of these images as well. Yeah, Isabel is making a good point. When you think of the visual imagery of lynching, it's always about the moment of the death. And I'm not interested in that. We're not interested in that. Rather, can we find documentations that testify either to the life lived or in this case, the life forgotten? Mm -hmm. So the images we, we seek are ones that ask why. Like why is there no visual memory here? And how can we use our research and our, our heart to try to change that? So with that, we wanted to share with you a typical newspaper article that students will come across. Um, when we guide through students through research, they start week one, right? They get a case assignment and they begin to unpack newspapers. One of the things that makes lynching research enormously difficult is that you cannot just accept what a newspaper publishes, right? You can't just accept what a convict lease record shows you or what a governor's pardon record shows you. One of the challenges that students face is going beyond what they maybe think is high-level historical research, gathering the data and accepting it and pushing forward, and instead reckoning with the fact that even this newspaper article from, for many students, the newspaper that they grew up with, Montgomery Advertiser, um, is untrustworthy, is pushing forward a narrative about lynching, about a person's life that we need to deeply examine before we move forward. Yeah, a big challenge of the work is that there's no such thing as a transparent fact. Well, that's history 101. But in the case of this class, so many of the sources come from white newspapers that have such a vested interest in creating narratives that criminalize often the Black defendant or they heroicize a sheriff or a white community. So a big part of the class for students is how do you extract data from that? that's never gonna be trustworthy, but we have to begin to use to think about creating analytical tools to help explain the situation. And so often they'll, they, they meet and start with newspaper articles and then we, we work with them to extract what we can trust and not trust and then translate that into a metadata program of sorts. Again, part of the difficulty is also that we're using these sources to try to uncover a person's life. Um, so for a student, what they have to learn and relearn and relearn throughout the semester is how do you read a source like this and come away with something that could begin to resemble a biography of James Earl Motley's life, right? So what a student would then draw from this is his age, perhaps that he's from the Montgomery area, but that's what this article could offer for you about his life, and, and that's part of the challenge here. Yeah. Also, what's interesting here is there's a reference to, to a legal trial of sorts. So that begins a pathway. Can we get to the grand jury trial? We, when we go to the courthouse, can we ask about this? Can we find out the judge? Can we find about the jury? Can we locate who the circuit court um, people were that we, we can begin to track their life that way? Yeah, part of what makes the class exciting is that there's this constant fluidity of the research, right? That we have a model in our head of what we know students should do to just check off due diligence of covering different newspaper databases and genealogical databases. Often each case has a different need and a research requirement. So a case like this one will require that student to visit Elmore County to go through those court records. Okay. So when a student finds a source like this, um, it's typically within the first couple of weeks of research, and then they go to Research Alabama Memory. This is the platform developed by a CS major named Nick Daria, who took the course three years ago and chose to stay on, has chosen to stay on every semester since. Um, this came out of a need to meet the growing needs of the project. 
we were working literally off of Google Sheets to organize metadata, which I think in early iterations made complete sense, right? Especially when we as a university still use the Google Suite. Um, but we don't anymore. And even before we switched over to Microsoft and to Outlook, it became cumbersome and unwieldy. We had so many sources. We're into the thousands of sources to document victims' lives that it, it didn't make sense. And we needed something that would also be accessible to students immediately that they could visually process and understand rather than trying to explain to them every category of metadata. Yeah, so for me, the key point here is the undergraduate worked with us to develop a research hosting platform that students have immediate access to. And then, it, and then we basically pull from this into, into, into like a metadata platform. Um, the key here is that undergraduates are designing, leading in this case, which they're, they're writing code, they're imagining the, the research platform. And it's a constant iterative process. We get feedback almost weekly from students asking for updates or asking for tweaks. Yeah, so you'll see here February update, click to learn more, right? There's an update every month that responds to student needs from the class. This one in part was just improving our OCR. Um, in years past, when I started in the class, we had to manually transcribe every single source. We now have an OCR reader that we use for the source, and that we're always working up bugs. Um, students always run up against the wall when it's a handwritten source. Why can't the OCR read this? That's okay. Uh, but overwhelmingly, the workload has shifted because of this. Yeah. So I'm going to show you guys now more in depth of what Research Alabama Memory looks like. Um, when you log in from the student end, you see a case that you're assigned. Any deadlines upcoming? Currently, they don't have any research checks upcoming, so there are none there. And then resources. The resources lead you to the library's page that has all of our primary source bases. That includes newspapers.com, um, that includes ProQuest newspapers, or even going into genealogical sources like Ancestry. It also includes the email for Alex Boucher, who's a librarian who's worked with this project primarily for the last seven years. So everything a student should need is right here and held right here for them. When you click in, you'll see your assigned case, which you can open up. One thing that we've added for this as well that works for the instructor side is the statistics thing, right? This shows you the statistics for the case, what types of newspapers have been collected or documents have been collected, how many of them are transcribed, how many of them have images, how many of them have the URLs that show the original source base. This allows us to very quickly check in on students' metadata work and see, are they keeping up with things? Do we need to lean in a little bit more? When you click into your case, It'll take you to the case number, the date of the case, location, and the victim's names. You can organize by creation date or title, city publication date. Um, we recently met with Nick and we'll add soon tabs to sort by source types in addition to this. You can download a CSV file here that shows you a batch editor of all of your cases, which is enormously useful. And if you click here, you can add a source from other cases. If you have a, more than one case assigned, you can drag in sources and co-edit, again, the way you would in a Google Doc, right? That way students will be all on the same page. When you click into a source, this is what was so valuable to us. We wanted to be able to prompt for students to fill out standardized metadata for every single source. Um, what we were running up against with Google Sheets was a lack of standardization, confusion over what do I put for a publisher if it's a marriage certificate? How do I do this work? With this, that again looks really a lot like a Google form. It makes sense to students. It makes the metadata accessible and it helps us keep things standardized. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a marriage certificate um, for a case from 1899 for a man named Lewis Swindle. Um, this is transcribed. If you can see here, you can click into the attachment editor where the JPEG was uploaded and the OCR was uploaded. OCR legacy, it'll be updated with our March update, which we're excited about. For a source like this one, which is a genealogical record out of the different records that we have decided, and this was a longer conversation as well over the last several years of what metadata categories we wanted to assign here for source types. Um, this is a genealogical record. We could have been a state record, but it's specific about that person's life, so we wanted to make it clear there. There, there's no author. There is no specific publication space unless we wanted to say in Elmore County, but we will have the date and the transcription for a source like this one. We also wanted to show you guys briefly um, what it looks like to upload a source like the one we just looked at all together. So when we look at this newspaper source, right? How, what will it look like for a student to upload that themselves? How will they navigate that? 
the goal is that what I experienced as a freshman, which was, I'm making it sound very, very difficult. It really wasn't, but it felt very, very difficult of, oh my gosh, I have to manually transcribe everything. I have to get the metadata right, it's streamlined. So the first thing a student should do is go into their files, find the image of whatever source they have. And then they just go into the OCR, which will run this for them. Um, the OCR, works best with newspaper articles like this, right? That has one or two columns that's so pretty easy to work for and through. Sometimes the OCR necessitates uh, manual transcription. That's just how it is. That's how this work is, especially again with genealogical sources like handwritten letters and notes. Okay. Once it's OCR through, you can edit and accept or copy over, accept and save. And then you would put in the newspaper article title, you would put source type, which is one of the first things you should do. That's a newspaper. No authors here, of course. Authors are typically specific to oral histories, to be totally honest. The publisher is the Montgomery Advertiser. Publication place is Montgomery, Alabama. And then the date. One thing that's really important here is the publication space. This is where the bulk of our data analysis has been thus far, is using the place of publication to understand how lynching research and knowledge of lynching travels across the country. Let me jump in there. So what, we, we track many different things, but what's most interesting for students is how so many articles get published about one lynching in Alabama. So sometimes we'll have 200 articles around the country, literally, from someone who lost their lives in Sylacauga. And that allows us over a period of years to map thousands of what I call publication networks such that we begin to see a different way to understand how ideas about Black criminality or, or Black guilt or the presumption of Black guilt get developed nationally. We track, for example, lots of publications appearing in, the, in New England or in the upper Midwest. And that often maps along paths of Black migration. So in many ways, in this case, these individuals from Alabama or other parts of the Deep South can never escape these ideas about them. It just gives a different understanding of how a narrative about Black guilt and Black criminality, again, develop and take hold nationally, even though crimes are, are with lynching history tend to focus in the South, although not exclusively. Yeah. One of the things we're really excited about moving forward with our migration from WordPress to Omeka is the increased ability to use what Omeka offers to do analysis just like mm -hmm. this, right? Omeka's mapping will work better with the metadata or more fluidly. Um, Emeka's timeline examples will allow us to map these things out as well. Mm -hmm. Also, I wanted to highlight just a couple more things on the metadata. One is an alt text box. Um, of course, it's necessary for every image that doesn't already have a transcription. So students are trained in what it means to create alt text as well. If I were checking this for a student's work, I would say, where is your URL? Why do I not see where you got this from? If it's newspapers, if it's ProQuest, whatever it may be. You can also click here to get the case date, which will take you ideally closer to what the actual date of this is. So that makes things easier for students. One of the big strengths of Research Alabama Memory is that it allows us to download every single source organized by case and by victim into one massive CSV file that we can easily import into a website so that we're not manually uploading every single piece of data. Um, that was the original aim of Research AM, actually, was in addition to allowing a more fluid experience for undergraduates, it made our publication process much smoother. Students can keep research notes right here, but those will never be published, those are always internal. Everything above the research notes, though, that's what's published, right? That's one of the reasons why we spend so much time working with students, training them in metadata processing, but also checking in every single week. What are the students working on? Is everything transcribed? The statistics bar is, again, an enormous tool for us and just been really helpful. Yeah. The research notes there are interesting because that's where the students breadcrumb. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they tell us where they've been. They ask questions there, and then we can go back and forth. That's another way to invite them to be an intellectual. We're not interested in just what you find, but how you found it. Sure. So tell us. Tell us where you were. Tell us the mistakes you made, maybe. Those are often the most interesting pieces of, of, of this slide for me as a professor, is to see how their mind's working and how it changes over time. Yeah, so it's actually a requirement for students to have research notes on every source they find for the first third of the semester. 
because we want them to begin to train themselves to think that way. But it's also just valuable information for us as instructors. It's interesting to see how different students approach the research. Um, everything they upload to Research Alabama Memory is paired with a blog post or a journal entry on their Blackboard site. The blogs have specific prompts asking them to think about their research in different ways, and the journals provide a private space. Only Dr. Giggy and whoever else is an instructor that semester will be able to read them for students to reflect on the emotional toll of their research. Um, as much as this site facilitates the data entry and makes much of this so much easier, I cannot emphasize enough, and it works much better for us. Um, it doesn't give space for that. One of the great things about working with Omeka S is it'll allow for different kinds of narrative analysis, I think, more quickly. Mm -hmm. Students are asking questions that can be best answered by relying on Omeka S. So, for example, how does the presentation of law enforcement change over time in these articles, tracking them over 100 years? How does the portrayal of, a, of the victim, which is typically a white woman in over a third of the cases, how does that change over time? What's the vocabulary being applied? So what's nice is to be able to take a student inquiry and demand and then answer it through a metadata process that I think will be very rich. And what's nice about this, and this is really, really new in sort of the field of racial violence, is be able to track thousands of pieces of data over time to give a sense of how the narrative about life's lost, about lynching changes, and just allows students and ourselves to pause and see how vocabulary changes and evolves over time. Yeah, much of the historiography thus far has been concerned with individual cases and starts with the death and moves from there, right? How does this affect a community? Um, so again, every part of this project is designed to facilitate what actually happens before the death. Who was this person? What was this community before this murder happened? Um, so we're designing at every level to, to meet what's thus far been underrepresented in our scholarship. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to quickly show you what the admin side looks like. This is where we can see statistics for every single case that's ongoing, which the cases are wiped at the end of each semester and automatically uploaded through that import-export CSV process to our back end of our websites. This gives us a quick overview to see how is the class doing globally, and then we can go into individual, individual cases and see how each student is doing. Our deadline editor is here, user management, which again allows us to manage which students have access. Nick put a contact Nick button in because he did make this thing. So but that's very useful. This is where we export sources. This is a thing that's been a godsend, truly. Um, we're still in development for what that will look like to transfer to Omeka, but already the process has proven to be much more fluid, easier than trying to force that into to what WordPress offers. And then here's where we add in new locations. Are we doing a new county? Do we need to add a different source type? Do we have something underrepresented here? That's where all of this information lies for us. And again, it's facilitated research that is just enormously complicated for students to learn, for us to teach and teach well. Um, this has been an enormous tool for us. Yeah. So that's Research Alabama Memory. It's always in process. Something we value for this is that we're able to respond to student feedback so regularly that students can see that they have a problem with OCR and it's addressed quickly, which happened last month. That students can see actually there's a way to sort sources that we need different, uh, it's been useful. We wanted to show you now is what we imagine for our website going forward. Um, our public facing website thus far has, I think, done a good job of representing what the research did up until we changed our methodology a couple of summers ago. Um, to give a little bit of a backstory there, we originally based counts of victims in the state off of pre-existing data from CSDE, from Tuskegee, and from EJI, um, all of which do excellent work. Mm -hmm. categorizing and organizing the legacy of lynching in the state and in the Southeast and the nation. But a couple of summers ago, some undergraduates and graduates worked together and just shifted their search terms a little bit, changed the way they searched and found that the 11 cases we thought existed in Tuscaloosa County were actually closer to 78. And now since then, we know that there are closer to 100 victims of lynching in the county. Right. So what we see here is an older representation of our project. Yeah, what's interesting is the impulse to really refigure the, the search imagination came both from undergraduates and grad students, but also people that wanted to speak about the impact of lynching in their life. Mm -hmm. I had one woman um, who was older in her 90s, and she said, I'm going to tell you a story, and you have to believe me, but you won't find it in a newspaper. And then she proceeded to talk about a lynching in her family. 
but the invitation there was many full, but one piece of that was to go back to traditional ways of searching and imagining research and shake it. Maybe we've made mistakes. We have made mistakes. Maybe our terms are different. Our chronological brackets are different. We need to be in conversation with different people, some of whom were in the academy, some of whom are not. So marrying that invitation to rethink the research process with undergraduate and graduate energy led to uh, a robust reaccounting of the number of victims that are documented. So in Tuscaloosa County, we moved from 11 document cases to over 100. In the state itself, the, the published list of lynching victims up until very recently was roughly 430. Now we're pushing close to 1,000. Mm -hmm. And this is largely because of an invitation from an older citizen to, to, to rethink methodology and then working with students to take that seriously and change every term, change the brackets. The other piece of this, of course, is technology, right? As databases are becoming more accessible, as our libraries and our institutions invest in them, it makes possible redoing or rethinking of the limits of, of research up until this point. Yeah. One thing that our course benefits from is alumni returners. Um, you've heard us reference a couple of times, graduate students that return and work, many of them are like me. They had the class in undergrad and they've stayed at UA for their graduate degrees and want to continue to invest in the project. So that sense of, of a network of a community powers much of this innovation and allows us to respond quickly when our invested community members say, you need to stop and rethink this. You need to stop and do something different. Um, we're really lucky to have groups of students that have stayed with the work and have responded in a way that's sustained and isn't incidental. Mm -hmm. What we wanted to display here is what our current source archive looks like. This is something we, again, hope to improve upon with Omeka. This is based off of our WordPress model. And this also reflects an older understanding of how our research works. So this allows people to search based off of source types, victim names. We have an example here for Cornelius and William Robinson, who were murdered in Pickens County in 1906. Currently, if you go by a victim, you'll see every source related to them, and you have to individually click into each source. A point of innovation that is in part because of working with ADHC and with Sarah is that we're going to include now data packets per victim where you, one person can very easily download an Excel document, something that's accessible regardless of the technology you have to look at every single source we've been able to compile for victims. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a lot of credit here, Sarah. The notion of creating a data packet that's easily extractable for someone who wants more information about an individual. And I'm, we're most concerned with family members, people that lost someone 50, 100 years ago. Can we give them what they want? Yeah. Um, in a quick way. I mean, also the other side of this is if they want to leave something for us that we can begin to work with them to maybe expand a database or think differently about things we've missed or need to do more with. Yeah, so all of the work that students do on Research AM is then represented here in the SORCUS archive and then represented with the individual victims' case files. Um, that's why the metadata is so important. That's why keeping these careful records is so important. Each victim's life is also paired with, in addition to the memorialization to their life, a research summary from students that guides them exactly through what those research notes allow. To say, this is what I did, and this is what I would do next if I could, if I had the time. Again, the value here is democratization. We want to show any invested community member exactly the steps that were taken and the steps they could then take next. Um, often what that results in is exactly like what Dr. Giggy mentioned from Ms. Lacey. Uh, the older woman in Elmore County who said, you have to listen to me. You have to hear me when I tell you this won't be there. People engaging and saying, you missed something, you need to push here. Um, that's been a, a real strength, I think, of the project. Mm -hmm. So once we have the sources organized and available to people in an archive, we then map them. We try to literally recreate the landscape of Alabama and here of Tuscaloosa County. We do that through our site visit photos and then through this, through a map that exclusively is concerned with sites of racial terror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an older workup and it's very much in process, but we're, we're imagining now is the, the Mecca basically unfolds into a county map of the state. And then when people click on individual counties, they're gonna have access to the data in a way that's digestible, but also extractable. This is just a, a prototype from a few, uh, maybe six months ago. Um, Tuscaloosa County at 76, and then clicking on that leads you to a map of Tuscaloosa County where individual victims are literally pinned on the map. And then if you mouse over it, you get a, a thumbnail sketch of the life lived and the life lost. 
So what we recognize too is that investor community members will engage with the site probably in one of two ways. One will be to search for a name that they know and the other will be to go to their account. We wanna make those things accessible and forefront them as points of navigation because um, we recognize that this is a local project. This is something that our community is invested in. We wanna facilitate that investment as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Finally, this is what our landing page will look like. This is a mock-up from our old site, but we want, again, to value and privilege what it means to rethink the landscape of Alabama. This is in Coaling. Uh, this is from a lynching in 1898. There's no marker here. This is a rail line. There's no way, unless you are a family member, a descendant, or a person that worked on this research, to know that there was an act of violence here. We want to make sure that the site keeps close to this idea of memorialization. Mm -hmm. might be interesting to think about things I wish I had done earlier or differently um and I did, I've done, done a really good job from the get-go like teaching about the history of lynching and challenging folks to think differently I think I came too late to aggressive partnerships on the digital side mm -hmm. um, I relied on sort of older technologies and even older imaginations secondly I wish I told myself this will take more time than you think, right? Uh, I think when you work in a team, when you imagine yourself in a lab and not just by yourself with a student or two, the timeline's longer. And what I've discovered is this kind of work requires a long timeline, but it promises a more robust and maybe a truer, broader history than we've had before. Mm -hmm. Part of the timeline as well is it encourages students to come back, whether it be as undergraduates or grad students, or most recently I visited with three alums from several years who were doing this kind of work elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wish I had thought hard about the timeline and they'd be more aggressively inter intersected with the digital parts that are now part of this project and could have been part of it earlier on. That said, though, this is also technologically sensitive, right? Omeka S is much more of an industry standard now than it was five or six years ago. <clears throat> so we have to respond to that as well as constantly hang on to the innovation wave and making sure we're not getting overwhelmed by it, but staying with it. Yeah, I think that's something that's been interesting about our conversations that we've been having is like, how do you document all of the research that you've done and keep it organized with all of your metadata and your items attached? You know, how do you keep that in the most stable way? And then consider building out these big projects as they're not secondary but they're they're like the larger step so you have you know the basics of a csv or a work a, a just an excel spreadsheet that has everything in it and then the the project is able to take advantage of some, some of these other technologies for the purpose of visualization and analysis, but you have your stable data set. And that's something that I'm that I'm seeing pretty ubiquitous ubiquitously across projects that I'm talking with that folks really are focusing on that visual representation through the digital project. Um, and perhaps neglecting the stabilization of that data for future um, access and, you know, archiving purposes. So that's a really good point. And so there's always a tension for non-DH specialists like myself, right? That can, what you just said can be really terrifying. Like, oh my God, what am I going to be doing, right? So you have to mix a sensitivity that was also a kind of brashness. Well, yes, but I will get there. Right? I'll work with you or other professionals, but also students to get there. There's this tension between you have to ask those questions. How do you stabilize the data for the long term? How do you imagine creating and crafting research programs so that visualization becomes something important, but not allow that to stymie the teaching, right? Or, or slow the starting point off for too long. Yeah, I think you guys have a really good sort of workflow and process in place to allow the data to sit. It took us six years, Sarah, do you realize that, right? Seven, seven. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. what I'm seeing right now. <laughs> it looks really good right now. Is it's that you've got, yeah, 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 you've yeah, got yeah. some of these things, you know, figured out in a really elegant way. Um, and I'm super excited about it. I, I want to hear a little bit, we've talked about the project, the project 
Isabella, I want to hear a little bit about mm -hmm. how this has shaped you as a researcher and sort of like how you see yourself in this project. And then what do you see yourself doing yeah. with all of this experience? Like at a certain point, you graduate mm. and your doctor, Isabella. Yes. And what <laughs> happens with that? So Dr. E is slowly turning towards me because he would also like to know the answers to some of those questions. Um, this course is, and this project is foundational to not just what I think I should be doing as a historian, but how I should live like as a person in the South. I mean that seriously. And that's not something I came to after the first semester. Um, actually, yesterday, we were jokingly going back through some of the first emails from that first class because Dr. Gigi was trying to organize a swarm of things. And one of the things I saw in that was how little I did as a freshman, how little research I did, how little work I put in to a project that I recognized could be transformative, but I was at that point largely unwilling to engage with that, to take that risk, totally honest. And it took years of being invited back in, of Dr. Gigi allowing us to engage with the work um, over several years for me to click it in a different way. One of the things that this work led me to was work in queer history, which maybe on paper at first glance sounds disparate, like these are two separate impulses and ideas, but the power of plumbing history that has been intentionally kept from our educational systems, that has been intentionally and violently sometimes hidden, um, drove me to think about how I see that in other ways across the Southeast, and especially as a person who grew up queer in the South and believed a myth that I was the only person, right? That's not true. Um, and I know that now based off of sustained historical work, not just in exactly queer history, but in this project, what this project asks. This is also, I mean, practically giving me like a higher level of research skills, da, 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 right? That's fine. That's good. But what this project has most demanded of me is a high level of intellectual and emotional engagement and work that otherwise, if I was numb to, I, I, I just can't imagine where I'd be and where I'd be right now. I only want to be a historian, and the reason I can really only imagine myself in a PhD right now is because of this work, because of the time to spend with students, with community members who choose to give us their time and their stories, which is overwhelming and humbling, truly. I mean, I, it's the only thing I can imagine myself doing right now because of a long journey <laughs> over seven years of engaging, not engaging as much as I should have. Um, and, and getting to work with students and see that what I experienced in the class and what it over a longer timeline prompted in myself is not specific to me, but actually universal. There's something in doing this work and confronting head on a history of violence in the South um, and seeking a point of memorialization from that, that across the board asks all of us to think about ourselves and how we exist in the South, how we choose to exist on this campus, but far outside of here in our own homes and our own lives. So what that means for me after I finish the PhD, ask me when I'm done with the PhD. <laughs> um, a lot of this now is risking and trusting, right? Trusting that the process of the work and what I know is valuable to me, what I know I should be spending my time on will point me to what I should do after, when I am Dr. Isabella. So check in in five years and, and we'll see. <laughs> it's interesting, Sarah. It's one of the analytical points buried in, in Isabella's few paragraphs there is that the research on lynching, or on, which can be which narratively looks like anti-Blackness. We've, we've discovered that many of those expressions and narrative tropes get applied to anti-queerness. So wasn't expected going in, but now it becomes more and more obvious as we, we look and sort of compare how stories or fictions get applied to, um, to different groups of marginalized Americans. It's one of the things you're, you're working yeah. on right now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that that is that is an area that lots of researchers are discovering a lot of overlap in. I know um, it's it's pretty prominent within my own work as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just that overlap of um, intersectionality and how it impacts folks as you're really looking at challenges and privileges and lack of privileges mm -hmm. um, and the way that we talk about people mm -hmm. based on where they are on that sort of spectrum or, or 
it's more of a network. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So you've mentioned um, alumni and you've shown us this amazing um, project that Nick has done. And I'm wondering what happens when Nick graduates and when does that happen? And like, what happens when a big part of your project moves on? Have you experienced that kind of project mm -hmm. loss for lack of a better yeah. Yeah. Um, in the past and how do you plan for it? And do you have, do you have like a, a, a system where a peer is going to move into that? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So part of it is you mentioned this earlier, like imagining processes of standardization that aren't dependent on individuals. Right. That said though, we do rely on individuals with certain skill sets that are computer-based in particular and Fortunately, we've had a strong succession of CS majors or CS affinity majors that are interested in getting under the hood and constantly thinking alongside of us. How do we create research hosting platforms that can unfold seamlessly into metadata analysis, acquisition? Um, and as you say, trying to make the process as stable as possible, such that the data itself becomes preserved in a stable environment for, for the next generation of students. Yeah, I think that that sense of sustainability for the project was a growth point earlier on. How do we make sure we can make this process as fluid as possible? It's something we're constantly responding to, whether it's on the teaching side. Um, every semester, the class now is co-taught along with Dr. Gigi by a, a graduate student. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure incoming students have the tools they need to teach as well as they can and to feel confident in that? Additionally, then, how do we make sure the project can change hands smoothly and that researchers and community members feel as little disruption as possible? Um, right now, we're in the process, Nick is graduating this semester as we speak, and so we're in the process of onboarding a new student who is both a CS and history major, so able to take their dual interests and skill set and begin to develop them towards the project. And we actually just met with him yesterday and spoke more about what the new website on Omeka can look like. Um, his right. skill set lies primarily in development and in aesthetics, and we're looking forward to working with him to take what we know is already powerful at Omeka, the data processing, and then pair it with his gifts in the aesthetic side. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what you guys do. I know that you'll you'll radically change the look of that um, yeah. that yeah. you know standard Omeka platform on the public side by you know changing up some of the css and the mm -hmm. the html i think it's going to be it's going to be fun mm -hmm. yeah i think so see what you guys do all right well do you have anything else that you feel like you need to chat about this for me it's been interesting I've, I've kind of i've been borrowing intellectual models from my scientist friends about creating labs basically and trying to enfranchise students at every level, undergraduate, graduate, but also high school students. I've, I've, I've spent time in high school classrooms over the years sharing this research and inviting them to join us. Mm -hmm. So much so that I have students coming from high school city schools to UA to do this work with us. Um, so I guess for a humanities scholar, maybe one of the messages I like to carry to folks is to think deeply in a cooperative fashion borrow other models from librarians or scientists who are who grow up thinking collaboratively whereas historians tend to by default work by themselves which has its own values but i just think there's room for much more collaborative growth in the humanities that leads to these kinds of these kinds of projects mm -hmm. i would just underscore that um, i think one of the resources a university model gives us is time that you have a little bit more time to do this mm -hmm. type of research and the, just your infrastructure of what a university can offer. I'd encourage other graduate students invested in humanities to see that as a value. I recognize we're all trying to also finish it and get to the degree, but to see the value in collaborative work that demands more of us, that asks us maybe to slow down, to see value in an undergraduate's voice in the same way we would from a professor's, to see value in a community member's voice, maybe even more than we would see in a professor's. Um, and allow that to prompt us to a different model of work and a different type of work. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. 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 
I'm so excited about all of the possibilities that we're looking at yeah. in the future. Yeah. Um, this is this is great. And this has been a really good conversation. I I know that I've heard many of these things before, but there are definitely new things that I've heard today. Right. And um I I think one of my favorite things about the position that I'm in is just hearing yeah. all of the amazing work that's happening and just think to myself, I'm a little tiny part of it. <laughs> You're a part I'm, of little it. Little tiny. Yeah. I'm like this this person that gets to just like sit here and and see all of these amazing amazing things happening. So thank you all for sharing this time with me. Um it's a generous of you to spend you know a, a full hour just chatting with me about all of this stuff and letting me prod you with questions um i would like to remind anybody who is listening which is going to be you know i'm going to post this so um there's nobody in the room at the moment but um next week i believe that our dh talk is on the cove collection which is um, primarily being used in our English department, but has some history and some philosophy and other humanities things in it. It's, it's a very large uh, textbook-like DH project that is not happening on our campus. It, we're participating in it, but it's not hosted by the ADHC. Um, and also upcoming on... Wednesday for our lunch and learn is going to be, I believe, uh, introduction to Python for the humanities, which is always a fun time. Um, that's going to be facilitated by Lance Simpson. So that's noon on Wednesday. I appreciate your time. Yeah, I have to run to teach. I have to run. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah. this is going to conclude our talk. Thanks, Sarah. Oh. See you soon. Bye bye now. Bye.